Hello. Good evening and a very warm welcome from all of us at the American Taylor Association. Tonight's program is quite an exciting one and one that fits our mission so well. At the American Taylor Association, we strive to explore and share the insights and the cosmic vision of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin and to affirm and carry forth his vision. What better way to do this than to pray with Teilhard, as we will be doing this evening? And what better way to pray with Teilhard than to come together with our esteemed authors of this newly published book, Teilhard de Chardin, A Book of Hours. 
I am so pleased to introduce the two beautiful women who have worked so assiduously to prepare this book and now this evening. Kathleen Noon Dignan is a sister of the Congregation of Notre Dame, a teaching theologian who studied with Thomas Berry at Fordham University. She has founded and continues to direct two institutions at Iona University, the Dignan Institute for Earth and Spirit and the Thomas Berry Forum for Ecological Dialogue. Kathleen is a Green Faith Fellow engaged in interfaith environmental leadership, a former president of the Thomas Merton Society, the author of at least four books, and, um, and a composer in residence with Scola Ministries that has produced a dozen collections of her original music, some of which we've already listened to this evening. And most important for me, Kathleen has been an exemplary member of the board of the American Association. And I would thank, like to take this opportunity to thank you for that, Kathleen. You're Lizzie welcome. Osgood, Lydia Osgood, is also a sister of the Congregation of Notre Dame, a former practicing engineer um, working on some of NASA's satellites. Libby is now Associate Professor of Engineering at the University of Prince Edward Island, well-respected not only for her teaching ability and her engagement in research, but also for the beautiful way that she works with her students. Libby is a member of the American Teilhard Association and quite a scholar of Teilhard. Proud of the fact that she has already read all of Teilhard's work at least twice. <laughs> That's quite an accomplishment. At our last annual meeting, Libby facilitated a wonderful Teilhardian conversation with a Jesuit Sky Consul Manu and Richard D'Souza about data coming from the James Webb Space Telescope. And as they will probably tell you, Libby and Kathleen made the best of their time during the first stage of the COVID uh, to reread the works of Teilhard and to organize the most beautiful passages from his work into this book of ours. And so without further ado, let us welcome Kathleen and Libby in our midst. Thank you very much. <laughs> So tonight we were what well, for this uh, prayer in the cosmos with Teilhard, um, we wanted to start uh, with with uh, a little bit of an introduction about the book, about how to pray with this book, because so many people find Teilhard very, very intimidating. I don't know if you're one of them, um, but so when Kathleen and I put put this book together, we wanted to make sure that it was accessible and to really find the most beautiful prayers that Teilhard has in his in his many letters and essays and and works um, and put them together to be able to pray with him that he, so he he can help us. So um, tonight we thought we would start with about 15, 20 minutes of talking about the book and ways to pray with it and to really bring out some of the most beautiful parts of, of what inspires us about Teilhard. Um, and then we'll go into praying together with him. And we have some wonderful speakers and who will pray with us as well. Um, and some music to infuse with it throughout, um, followed by, we'll have some time for small groups to think about how does, how does this affect you? How does Teilhard ring with you? What rings true? We, so we've got just two questions for you to chat with others, um, because that's part of the beauty of Teilhard is that it's not just a private prayer. It's so communal. It's so together. And he really invites us and encourages us to do that. And Kathleen, and I, I'll speak for myself, I suppose. I really hope this book um, allows people to do that both privately, but also together. Um, so with that, I will um, turn it over to Kathleen to welcome us to Teilhard. <laughs> Thank you so much, Libby. Thank you. And um, welcome. 
to this really exceptional number of people from so many parts of our planet this evening that you would desire to come and share with us this Teardian Vespers. It makes us so very happy. Uh, and I thank the members of the American Teor Association and especially Kathy Duffy, the president, uh, for this wonderful opportunity to be with you in this, what we hope will be a sacred space. It really has been Libby's and my joy to create this extraordinary rich, I think, uh, cosmic bravery from Teilhard's rich treasury of cosmopoetics. And I think all of us who have been illuminated or inspired by this priest scientist will be so happy to have a book, not just of his essays, not of his wonderful works, which as Libby has shared, can be quite daunting to move through, but to hold in your hand a book of his prayer, a book of his sacred vision um, that can aid us in this critical time for the human species. I want to say that Teor has opened for us a new horizon of prayer, but it might be more accurate to say maybe he has recovered for us a more primordial and original horizon of prayer. That horizon before which our earliest hominid ancestors millions of years ago experienced with incomprehension and wonder, the awe and the tremendous fascination of a mystery manifesting at every single turn that bound these cousins of ours to itself in a life bestowing communion experience. And the impact of such beauty and power set these vulnerable primates to stammer into a new mode of consciousness. And as we're going to see, Teor will hope that the same might be said of ours now as we arrive at a very critical juncture of our human evolution. Thought was born in the activation of spiritual energy aroused by this kind of raw, naked uh, apprehension of a cosmos and an, and, a, and a luminous cosmos and a sensuous planet that endowed those human kin of ours who survived with an incandescent vitality that became a new vector for Earth's unfolding splendor. Because as Teilhard will teach us, the human is the very unfolding of our planet's brilliancy, of its genius, of its exceptional nature. So this primordial horizon of a magical cosmos evoked in our cousins, these unlikely hominins, all the language and the music and the creativity that we inherit and still build upon in our present world-making enterprise. This cosmic and total earth horizon of mystery that Teilhard recently recovers for us through his science mind is in our time the new sanctuary of the sacred. Described now not in mythic narratives of the classical religious world, but now this new horizon of the sacred is described in theorems and equations by a scientific priesthood 
who stands before the, the universe equally enthralled as our ancestors were, and who likewise wish to know what we do. In Einstein's phrase, the mind of God. But we know that neither Einstein nor Teilhard's scientific comrades were actually interested in God, or at least their religiously inherited God, their culturally uh, inherited God. And as we know, the scientific enterprise of the past, past few centuries opened up a new arc of history in which the human became the measure of all things, with no guardrails or speed bumps to halt the human juggernaut now in progress. So this very anthropocentric world endeavor has sidelined the other kind of progress, which one poet has called our exploration into God. It has sidelined the human journey into what we call divinity in favor of a richly contrived material world to serve the dominant species, we ourselves, who now hold sway over all others. As we know, we have arrived at the Anthropocene, that is the age, in a sense, of the climax of the human. It's an era of promise and of peril, unprecedented in the great arc of the life of our one precious planet Earth. And the grave question before us is the very same one that Tayar so passionately, urgently, anxiously labored to articulate for us, for his generation, if we were to continue to make our way into a viable future, which is how shall we recover what the density of this global, industrial, technological civilization has buried beneath it? How shall we invigorate again that weakening pulse of spirit that labors to vitalize this planetary endeavor? And perhaps from this planetary position of Earth to contribute to the emergence of cosmic spirit of the whole. We are heirs, quite recently, to the newly and deeply discovered mysticism of science. A mysticism of investigation, exploration, analysis, theorization. And as Libby and I have reflected upon it, and others have as well, we would like to say that Teilhard is the first spiritual master, that is to say, spiritual teacher of profound wisdom and a guide for life within this evolutive universe. And the great gift of Teilhard is that he never bifurcated a material universe and a spiritual universe, but saw one as integral to with the other, a material universe bearing spirit into matter, bearing spirit through matter to what in his own visionary mind, would eventually become climax of spirit. 
And the great task of Teilhard that he took up, the vow that he made, was to, in some sense, be for the human community of his generation, and now for ours, the spiritual guide who would help regenerate an atmosphere of mystical intensity in which the world, the universe, the planet, the glorious sacraments of Creator would be the very ways that humankind would make its offering, make its way into greater consciousness of divinity. And more than that, even, would allow itself to become a medium, a mediator, a matrix for the birthing of divinity more fully, more really in the incarnate realm. Teilhard stands near us historically, but even more so, he stands near us in our contemporary, we might say, our postmodern sensibility, our postmodern minds, where the more we come to know the awesome wonders of this earth as an unfolding mystery of the universe itself, the more we come to be grounded in this historical moment, the more we yearn for the language the poetics by which we might do what our ancestor did originally stammer before the wonders we are beholding and receiving. Teor does that for us. Teor is not simply a meaning maker as he tells a new story of evolution as he tells a new story of the origins and destiny of the human, but as he offers us through his myriad letters and diaries and writings, ways to speak about divinity gestating within us as human beings, laboring to be born in us and through us, to give us such a language. This is the great mastery of our brother, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. And so this evening, we hope that we will offer an opportunity to let this language flow to us and through us in our prayer tonight, in our Vespers, as we become that, finally, the maturity of that species in whom divinity, as Teilhard's exquisite Christian imagination and our treasured Christian tradition says, has longed to be incarnate. So let us continue our prayer now, if we might, <laughs> to be able to let Teilhard's poetics carry us. Yeah, and, 
oh, into, the, into the sanctuary of praise. Yeah, I... I so appreciate hearing you talk because I feel like Teilhard, as a scientist, as a as an engineer, I find I say things more plainly. I think in statements. I think in and one of my most favorite things about Teilhard is that he has language like you do, like these beautiful phrases that I think, wow, how does that come out? Why are those words together? Like, and they're beautiful. And I never, but. You know, I pull back to the the bare root of things, of um, the simplicity of it all, right? And I find one of the most fascinating things about Teilhard is his ability to do both, right? Is he has the most beautiful language, and so this in composing this book with Kathleen, as Kathy said, it was over COVID, so we were doing it on the whole thing online in the newosphere, like Teilhard. Um, I don't think could ever have imagined mm. in a, you know, a different sort of thinking layer, not in the same way, but definitely thinking from Charlottetown, PEI, Canada, all the way to, to New Rochelle, New York, talking about this man who was living in China and France and sometimes New York, right? That it, it was such an exciting endeavor to be able to do together um, from that to enliven Teilhard, but also from the point of view of a science uh, of an engineer, uh, that the conversations that we were able to have and to play with his words, I learned so much more about him than I did through the reading, through our discussions, through picking a word and saying, "Well, what does that mean?" Mm -hmm. and pulling out the different uh, sentences. So, as we went through Teilhard's essays, we for the Psalms, at least in the book, we put it, broke it into different places and ended the line. But that meant we got to really go in and say, well, what does this line really mean? What is the emphasis? Where do we, where do we press enter? Where is the, just because there's commas, Tared thinks in so many parentheticals, he gets all the, oh yeah, but before you need to know that, you need to know this. And before I can say this, I need to tell you that. And I do that a lot in my E emails, there's parentheses everywhere. And I am now okay with it because Tear did it and he's published. So he's fine. Um, but I, so when we would go do these line breaks, it really got to pull out what is his meaning? What, what could he be meaning here? So as we're praying here, we included uh, where the ends of the, the, the breaks are, are intentional because we felt like that can help to pull out his meaning, to help understand him better is what is he emphasizing? Because I do find it's often hard to say, well, where is the pause here? Because that can change the whole sentence. That can change the whole meaning. Um, so I want to take just a second to talk about the how to pray with the book. Um, because if it's not that I'm pushing the book, but we it's it's so great to be able to have Teilhard guide us through dawn, day, dark, and dusk in a different order there. Um, and the the book has eight days. And a traditional hexameron, a, a praying with the the prayers, the da daily office would have seven days, Sunday to Saturday. Um, and there's tradition to say what happens on each day that often Friday being connected to Good Friday might be a day of, of suffering or of um, really leaning into that. Um, so the Friday of our of the book that we put together, we pulled together the prayers that are more connected to Teilhard helping us through really hard times. When those moments that we're struggling, what's his advice? Because he wrote so many letters about helping his cousin, helping his friends, himself struggling through many hard times. Those were the Fridays. Um, but we realized Teilhard is so much about tomorrow. As Kathleen said, who are we, that we are becoming who, who Teilhard envisioned or trying to become as spiritual beings and matter infused together. But he often looked, he looked at tomorrow as well. So we had to add an eighth day that's called tomorrow that looks ahead. So we started with um, the days and without going through just like a table of contents, I do think it's important to say what some of the days are because it shows 
some of Tarot's evolution of thought. Um, so unfolding con cosmos is Sunday. We start with the big bang. We start with the beginning and each of the days have a verb because nothing is static. In Teilhard's world, everything is energy. Everything is moving. Everything is in process. So unfolding cosmos as it continues to unfold. And we move into Monday. Teilhard was very Christic. Um, so evolving Christ, that Christ continues to, to be part of this world and was from the very first moments of creation all the way through. So Christ evolves with us. So if you're if you're looking for a really good Christ day, that's Monday, you know, to pray with Teilhard as he in his Christic spirituality. Um, Tuesday is one of my favorites. It's the invention of the earth. It's living earth. It's the and it's the real focus on if we're looking for a Laudato Si moment of praying with the earth around us. That's Tuesday. It's focused on all of the natural elements before human beings arrived before homo sapiens appeared. Um, and then Wednesday is that becoming human and getting into consciousness. And because today is Wednesday, we will be praying the Wednesday dusk hour um, together. And we'll see tonight, Teilhard, Teilhard was really interested in consciousness. He said, not only to know that, to know, but to know that we know. Admittedly, the animal knows, but it doesn't know that it knows. And that seems so simple, but in such a way that if we live our lives with awareness, we're living our lives very differently than without awareness. So if we live our lives in a way that we know we understand, that means we have a responsibility to act differently, to do things differently because we are aware and because we're endowed with this responsibility. Thursday is getting into building the world. So now that humans exist, we have a responsibility. And what is that? Um, and then, as I said, Friday gets into the creative suffering and Saturday is this extra day for transforming spirit because um, we are moving towards embracing this more spiritual matter connected world. So Saturday has some really lovely prayers about our responsibility of now what? Now we have this earth. Now we have this this world. Now we have consciousness. So what do we do with it? What do what do how do we move forward? Um, and then lastly, we get into tomorrow as toward Omega, moving towards this. Um, the, as he talks about the the complexity consciousness, the axis of heading towards um, towards a future. Um, that and yeah, so I'm pulling myself back because I want us to get into the prayers because I know Kathleen and I could go back and forth for hours and you'll just be like, no, 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 you promised we'd pray. So yeah, mm -hmm. we we do want to to allow us to do that. But I wanted to to bring you through those different elements and the way the book is structured with the dawn, day, dusk, and dark um, builds on Kathleen's book of hours from Merton's work um, and follows the same, that same beautiful structure and the structure of the prayers of the church, right? Like this, that, but that beautiful alliteration, um, I want to highlight came from the first book that I was lucky enough to get to work with her on the second book. And day is, or dawn is the idea that the world is, is, is beginning again. We have a brand new day, a brand new chance. So the prayers are very much an awakening prayer. Um, as we move into day, it gets into the, the thrust of the work. The, and Teilhard was all about that, right? He's this um, French priest, uh, geologist, anthropologist who ended up in China for decades because he was a little too forward thinking and a little bit too willing to share that with the people around him in a time that wasn't very accepting of that. And yet, while he's out there digging on expeditions, really in the grit, in the middle of the world, he comes up with this mass on the world. He discovers, he is one of the people that find Peking Man, um, homo sinanthropus, I think, essentially helping to prove the thing he was, um, he was sent out of France for. Like it, it, it's, I love the irony. I love, I love that he does that. So for him, day is really getting into the work of it. So many of the prayers are getting into the work of the day. 
And then dusk is as the day is starting to come to a close. And of course, dark is lulling us off to sleep. So with all of that said, Kathleen, are we ready? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So um, with that, I will call us to prayer and we have um, a slideshow here with different music and things involved. And we will begin uh, with as a, um, a moment to collect. Await more steadfastly than ever the coming of the spirit of the earth. Lord, the luminosity and fragrance which suffuse the universe, take on for me the liniments of a body and a face. You. To Terra Mater, and through her to Christ Jesus, above all things. The power to appreciate and to open the heart is indispensable to the awakening and the maintenance of the mystical appetite. Let us establish ourselves in the divine milieu. There, we shall find ourselves where the soul is most deep and where matter is most dense. There we shall discover where all its beauties flow together, the ultra vital, the ultra sensitive, the ultra active point of the universe. And at the same time, we shall feel the plenitude of our powers of action and adoration, effortly, effortlessly ordered within our deepest selves. No one can compel the gaze of God. A breeze passes in the night. When did it spring up? Whence does it come? Whither is it going? No one knows. No one can compel the spirit, the gaze or the light of God to descend upon them. On some given day, one suddenly becomes conscious that they are alive to a particular perception of the divine spread everywhere about them. Question them. When did this state begin for them? They cannot tell. All they know is that a new spirit has crossed their life. 
it began with a particular and unique resonance, which swelled each harmony with a diffused radiance, which haloed each beauty. All the elements of psychological life were in turn affected. Sensations, feelings, thoughts. Day by day, they became more fragrant, more colored, more intense by means of an indefinable thing, the same thing. Then the vague note and fragrance and light began to define themselves. And then contrary to all expectation and all probability, I began to feel what was in ineffably common to all things. The unity communicated itself to me by giving me the gift of grasping it. I had, in fact, acquired a new sense, the sense of a new quality or of a new dimension. Deeper still, a transformation had taken place for me in the very perception of being. Thenceforward, being had become tangible and savorous. And as it came to dominate all the forms which it assumed, being itself began to draw me and intoxicate me. In the silence of the night, I can hear. Already in the silence of the night, I can hear through this world of tumult, a confused rustling as of crystalline needles forming themselves into a pattern or of birds huddling closer together in their nest. A deep murmur of distress of discomfort, of well-being, of triumph, rising up from the unity which is reaching its fulfillment. Through every cleft, the world we perceive floods us with its riches. Food for the body, nourishment for the eyes. The harmony of sounds and fullness of the heart. Unknown phenomena and new truths. All these treasures, all these stimuli, all these calls coming to us from the four corners of the world cross our consciousness at every moment. Being. We might say that the whole of life lies in that verb. Union increases only through an increase in consciousness. That is to say, in vision. And that, doubtless, is why the history of the living world can be summarized as the elaboration of ever more perfect eyes 
within a cosmos in which there is always something more to be seen. And now we invite you to a few minutes of silence. Ahead of us, there must lie something immortal. To perceive it calls for training the inner eye. Three things, hiding, fugitive, song, a sunbeam, a glance. So at first, I thought they had entered into me in order to remain and be lost in me. On the contrary, they took possession of me and bore me away. Through the sharp tips of the three arrows which had pierced me, the world itself had invaded my being and had drawn me back into itself. The vibration aroused a resonance in all my affections. It drew me out of myself into a wider harmony than that which delights the senses, into an ever richer and more spiritual rhythm that was imperceptibly and endlessly becoming the measure of all growth and all beauty. I felt my body, my soul, 
and even my spirit passed into the ethereal tint, unreal in its freshness that caressed my eyes. Serene and iridescent, its color bathed more than my senses. It in some way impregnated my affections and thoughts. I melted away in it, lost in a strange yearning to attain some individuality vaster and more simple than my own, as though I had become pure light. And under the glance that fell upon me, the shell in which my heart slumbered burst open with, and with pure and generous love, a new energy penetrated into me or emerged from me, which I cannot say that made me feel that I was as vast and as loaded with richness as the universe. Now we have a moment for, for our in, to community, for each of us to share a, share a prayer. <laughs> So we invite you to please chat into the chat for each of us to see a moment for intercessions. What are the prayers of this world that we want to bring forward today? And with so many of us on, if we can just have a litany beautifully running through uh, for us to, to share in this world. We pray for hope. We pray for gratitude. For the young at heart to come into this consciousness. For the end of wars. For our broken world. For continued growth in unity. Acceptance of others who are different. Trans people. People with disabilities. For imprisoned and violated. May all beings know this oneness. This freedom. This love. During this season of creation that we grow more aware of our connectedness to each other, to the world, to the universe. For liberation and healing of the people of Haiti. For the wellness for all of us who feel lost. For all the children in the world. For the graciousness and the brokenness. Healing our earth. Prayers for ecological conversion and integral ecology. A prayer that all may experience divinity within ourselves and all. Peace on earth and love and trust unending for all youth. For our beautiful blue planet. May we love so deeply that we do all we can to protect mother earth for innocence of heart, for the stars, for inclusion and reconciliation with First Nations people, for justice and for homes for the unhoused, for the end of the div division and the gift of the unity of the universe, for kindness to the refugee, the immigrant, for those who are sick and alone, for eyes opening to awe each day, for the homeless, that they may find a safe place to land. For the homeless and the depressed. We pray today that awe for our universe on its many scales that Teilhard captures is accessible and felt 
by all on this planet. That beauty may touch the hearts of all. That no one should be without a home on this earth for forgiveness and return to sincere love and caring, for kindness to pervade our world, for the mystical appetite, for faith and trust in the universe, for the unity of all our minds in the spirit of the future, for trust in the slow work of God, for mercy and forgiveness, for radical solidarity and justice, for Christy, who is dying to new life tonight. That all may be one, that we come to honor and respect the consciousness of animals, for truth in media, and lastly, for our wonderful pets, our cats, birds, fish, dogs. And one more, oh, a few more, we'll keep going. These are beautiful. This is a wonderful litany of the world. Stretch my soul high to the clouds, pink and gold, sing through the rhythm of time to an internal dawn of life and to the perfection of our creator. and to be able to laugh at ourselves and to respect all. And now we're going to move into what is Teilhard's um, Lord's Prayer. And I ask you all while you are on mute because the sound of Zoom just goofs everything up. It's um, eight o'clock. To please pray with us out loud or at, with me as I read this, but with us together while you're on mute. <laughs> Lord of my childhood oh, and Lord of my last days, God, complete in yourself, yet for us continually becoming born. God, you offer yourself to our worship as evolver and evolving, the only being that can satisfy us. Sweep away at last the clouds that still hide you, the clouds of hostile prejudice and of false creeds. You have become for my mind and heart much more than God who was and who is. You have become God who shall be. So let us pray. Let there be revealed to us the possibility of believing at the same time and wholly believing in God and the world, the one through the other. Let this belief burst forth as it is ineluctably in the process of doing under the pressure of these seemingly opposed forces. And then we may be sure of it, that a great flame will illuminate all things. For a faith will have been born or reborn, containing and embracing all others, and inevitably, it is the strongest faith which sooner or later must possess the Amen. earth. Amen.
And so we have a moment now to for sharing circles. And we're going to Zoom you off in breakout rooms to share with a few others what moved you in this prayer. Where is praying with Teilhard taking you? How might Teilhard as spiritual guide transform you? And notice the two questions. One is a past. What moved you? What, is, what has this been experience been for you? But then in a true Teilhardian way, let's also focus number two on looking ahead. Where is praying with Teilhard taking you? How do we leave transformed by Teilhard, by, by praying with Teilhard, praying through his words? Um, so notice the, the, the two movements that we, we suggest here, um, and looking at our time, we'd like for when you come back, when you return, because of course, with so many people on, we don't have time to share, um, everything. We'll ask you to do like we did in the intercessions and return with the grace that you leave with a word or a phrase to put in the chat. And this time we can open the mic up and have a litany of one word or phrases um, afterwards. So these are your instructions. <laughs> and we will send you off now for those who remain. I'm letting the numbers change. <laughs> um, to, and actually, as I do this, let me type the questions in so you have them in your breakout. So what moved you in this prayer? This is the functional part. <laughs> and where is praying with Teilhard taking you? How might Teilhard as spiritual guide transform you? And one of the fun things about Zoom, I have to do this before you go to your breakout rooms, otherwise you won't get it. <laughs> and then return with a grace. Okay, so now that our numbers have stabilized a little bit, uh, we will send you off for, I think we said 15 minutes. Um, so let me do this and you'll have the countdown timer and we'll bring you back after 15 minutes. Okay, I think all the rooms have closed. So we'll open up the mic now and the figuratively. So if anyone would like to share, we can just do a, a litany of graces of a word or a phrase, or you can share it in the chat as well. And we'll read those out. Friends, are we sharing graces that we feel came to us in that in that immersion into the poetics of Teilhard de Chardin, deep dive into his gorgeous language. Integral awareness. Mm -hmm. Love language. Thank you, Elizabeth. Great to see you. I received a grace from Carol in my group who said that her young nieces love the language of prayer of Teilhard. That made me so happy and hopeful. I loved when we talked about allowing ourselves to be a matrix for Christ's love and for the birthing of consciousness in all. Thank you, Pamela. I was moved by the His Lord's Prayer. Um, I thought, how gutsy. I've always thought, because I did buy the book right away, and that he would um, have that much trust in God that he could write his own Lord's Prayer. But it was part about sweep away at last the clouds that still hide you. And um, when I jog at night, and I see the clouds, it's very easy to uh, 
express that again and enumerate on it and ask the Lord to take the clouds from my my life too. Full confession, Elizabeth. He didn't write a Lord's Prayer. We discovered what we thought could be a Lord's Prayer among his writings. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was taken from um, HM, uh, 50, page 5658. Mm -hmm. It's okay. among his writings. Yeah. We thought it sounded like a Lord's Prayer. Oh, okay. Okay, well, I knew what you did. I just, oh, okay. I see, I did a flip in my head there. It's okay, it still works. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Heart of Matter. It was from page 5658, Heart of Matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was moved to be in a group with three other elderly nuns like myself were all gifted with a god's gift of years and yet as we spoke i felt i felt young i felt youthful in our love for tayard's language and how it has um grown and and opened us to god and to the world justine you're always youthful <laughs> thank you I, I was moved by the um, the closing prayer, the first uh, verse. Let those be revealed to us the possibility of believing in the same time and holy in God and the world, the one through the other. So I was trying to interpret that if we, uh, the possibility that we all believe at the same time in God and the world, and that I would think God's love would, you know, flow through us into each other. I, I was just trying to interpret that. I think with Teilhard, you really have to read it many times to try to understand what his message was. So, anyway. I do, I do love Teilhard's question, um, who will give evolution its God? Uh, because we do need a new God. And it's amazing that his, his work is coming to us now, just when we need this new God, the, the God of evolution. I, I think he, he asked that question, but I would answer that he is the one who has given us evolution's God. And uh, it made God so close and also so open that God is becoming and that we're all part of that. It's so wonderful to be living at this time and to know that uh, we can say good goodbye to a God of the past in some ways and to look forward to this wonderful God of the future and the God becoming. Uh, so I, I thank Teilhard for, for the question and that it answered. Thank you, Jean. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, see? I am taking the grace of this embodied, matter of fact, ecstatic awareness. <laughs> Thank you both for bringing it to us so beautifully and powerfully. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Casey. In our group, we shared uh, that feeling of, of expansiveness and kind of no limits from the, the vocabulary and from the, the writings of Teilhard. And um, and we we each can share the same feeling, I believe, that uh, the peace that there is when there is great openness in the landscape around us and how that in some way brings an intimacy with 
creator, God, um, the, the, the universe, whatever. But it, it's a kind of a strange feeling of being very small and yet there being this expansiveness around us at all times. Thank you. And um, my reflection was similar to Mary Ann's, I'd say, a bit. Um, for me, the, the grace of this evening is looking at the pay art, I think, breaks open the, the breadth and the depth of God at the same time. Uh, that God is so, so, so expansive and so, so deep. And um, how wonderful because it, it it lets me see even more deeply how everything belongs. There's nothing excluded. And don't we need that so much in our world today um, to have that view of an expansive God that embraces everyone and all being, all matter. And, um, you know, when you did the invocation tonight, I almost couldn't go any further. I was so taken with it. Lord, the luminosity and fragrance which suffuse the universe take on for me the liniments of a body and a face. You. You. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much. You said that so beautifully. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe one or two more. James. I'm left with the grace of clarification of thought, to use a phrase from the Catholic worker movement. And I'm also left with the grace of refinement of senses. I'm struck by the intensely sensory qualities of the spirituality that was shared tonight. And I think it really powerfully breaks through a kind of false dichotomy of spirit matter that for Teilhard spirituality is the intensification of the senses and there's no separate spiritual realm or separate set of spiritual senses that to be immersed in matter in this kind of sacramental worldview is to enter into the divine milieu so i'm yeah. left with the desire to do that more deeply powerful james thank you so much that really crystallized so much of Taylor's vision, seeing. Would anyone like to have the last utterance? Amen. Amen to that. There you go. Amen to that. Kathy Duffy. President of the American Taylor Association. Would you like to have the last word? I would love to have the last word. Thank you <laughs> for <a> change. <laughs> uh, but I, first of all, what I want to say is thank you to Kathleen and Libby for this wonderful presentation. So it was so good to hear how this book came about and how it can be used and then to use it in such a beautiful way the music and the art and the way you read through the those marvelous passages i think moved all of us i know that happened that was clear in our little breakout group so um i'm really grateful to you for a wonderful presentation so thank you and i think we're all very grateful but i would like to uh, end by inviting all of you who are not yet members of the American Taylor Association to join. Um, it's very easy to find our website, just um, just search for the American Taylor Association and you'll be able to find out how to join. I put it in the chat, but there's so much in the chat you won't find it. And we have lots of the other events coming up like um, in, in October, for instance, we're going to be in um, uh, in New York. Uh, the French Association is coming to uh, celebrate with us the 100th anniversary of Teilhard's The Man from the World. 
and we'll have some conferences and walks through New York. And the high point, I think, is the celebration of a ritual mass on the world at Teilhard's gravesite. So if you're interested in that and haven't heard anything about it, please be in touch with the Teilhard Association and we will get you more information. Uh, Tracy Higgins is going to talk about Teilhard in New York in um, November, November 15th. You're welcome to join us. In January, we'll have a members meeting where our members come together and talk together and share their views about things. And then we always have a wonderful annual meeting in the spring. So um, do join us and um, come back for, for more events. And uh, once again, thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Libby. And I hope everybody runs out to buy your book. <laughs>